in all kinds of Python crimes for uh, five or six years now. We've had lots of adventures together. Um, it's always really interesting to hear Vincent speak because he's always finding new ways to use mathematics and coding to pick the world apart and peer into how it works inside one, one line of code or one mathematical function at a time. Please welcome uh, Vincent. Thank you, Daniele, for a very, very kind introduction. Um, so, so yes, I'm going to talk to you today about using Python to train my dog. Um, a little bit about myself. I'm a uh, mathematician here at Cardiff University. Um, I'm also one of the organizers of uh, this conference. I'm also uh, a core developer on a, a couple of open source uh, mathematical Packages. The logo you see there, that third one along the line, is for the Axrod package, and Owen's also in, in the audience, and uh, Nicoletta, who's contributed a lot to it. And I'm also a fellow of the Software Sustainability Institute. So Tanya's talk this morning I thought was really fascinating, and it felt like um, I was a, a real audience to that. So I felt really targeted by that talk, which was really interesting. Um, but I'm more or less going to talk to you about nothing that has anything to do with any of this. Um, I'm going to talk to you about uh, my dog. Um, my dog's the one on your right. Um, on, on the left is my, my son, JJ. Um, and I've been on parental leave for, for three months hanging out with him. Today is my first day back at, at work. Um, and I won't talk too much about this, but I just want to highlight if anyone is thinking about taking uh, parental leave or paternity leave or, or something like that and is not sure about it, please do come talk to me about it because it's been the most wonderful three months of my life and I would encourage anyone to, to do that. But I'm going to talk about Riggins, my dog. Um, Riggins is a working line border collie, um, which uh, means that he's a border collie who has been uh, designed to work. Uh, we, we got him from a farm in uh, Swansea where uh, his uh, mum and dad were both dogs that worked. So, they, so he's, he's not really designed uh, to be a pet. Um, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about dog behavior. Um, has anyone heard of Caesar Milan before? Yeah, a few hands going up. So Caesar Milan had a, is a dog trainer. Um, he had a TV show on the National Geographic channel for a few years. Um, it was incredibly popular. Um, and he uh, had this, on his TV show, had this magic-like ability with dogs. People would hand the lead of a dog that was barking and unhappy to him, and he'd just hold the dog, and the dog would just fall asleep. Um, and he did this all through uh, his energy, and uh, following on from the notion that the thing a dog really needs is to know that someone is in charge, to know that there is a pack leader so that it can kind of turn its brain off, so to speak, and just give the responsibility to the pack leader. And that idea really stems from a paper written in 1947 by Rudolf Schenkel, who uh, studied wolves in captivity. Um, because when you studied wolves in captivity, you were really seeing that that the wolves needed to know the hierarchical structure of, of the, the pack. Um, this idea was further kind of confirmed in the 1970s where a gentleman called David Meck saw this kind of idea in wolves in the wild. So in the wild, he was seeing the alpha and the beta wolf. And uh, that's actually where the term alpha and beta comes from, is from, from this um, book. The thing is, um, that's more or less understood to be wrong. Um, and, and all the studies nowadays say that if you're using confrontational techniques, which were often uh, associated with this idea of a dog needing to know who the alpha was, that you know, you'd, you'd get trainers that would growl at a dog or trainers that would force roll a dog, so roll the dog over onto its back so it was in a submissive position so it knew that you were the alpha. Um, or something that Cesar Milan used to do on his TV show a lot is he would just, uh, I, I'm using the word hit, but 
I, I wish I could figure out a better word, he would make contact with his uh, fingers and the dog's chest in a quasi-painless way, but kind of to uh, simulate the nipping of a, 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 a mum. But all these ideas have basically been shown through all the research that has been done uh, to have undesirable effects. So for example, this is a survey paper where they surveyed a number of dogs that had, well, a number of dog owners that had uh, bad behaviors. So they were aggressive or, or similar and were being, uh, trying to be forced into dominance. They in fact ended up even being worse. And in fact, David Mech, so the gentleman who wrote the book in the 1970s, who coined the term alpha and beta male, he actually wrote a paper in 2013, and he's, there's a fabulous video of him on YouTube where he, he essentially goes, no, no, this alpha and beta thing has really been misunderstood. Um, and, and really, uh, wolves in, in the wild are just families. And so there's, there's not the alpha on the beta. He, he talks about the male parent and the female parent. But even then, you're not seeing this dominance um, effect. And, and he talks about he's aware that his study on wolves and his definition of alpha and beta terms has probably had a negative effect on uh, dogs and dog training. Um, and another thing that's worth noting is these are two dogs. Uh, so that's Riggins, that's my, my border collie. And the dog on the couch there is uh, Toby. She's Riggins' best friend. She's the sweetest, prettiest little girl. And I, to my eyes, they look very different. Right, uh, Toby has uh, short legs. She has a very different uh, sized uh, head than, than Riggins does, um, and they have very different behaviors. But but fundamentally, they are not wolves. Uh, so when we try and, and decide how we should treat dogs based on how wolves act, especially if we do that on studies that were wrong about wolves, then we're just kind of making lots of mistakes along the way. And so you still get lots of kind of uh, common myths about dog behaviors, you know, oh, you should never let a dog on the couch, because if the dog's on the couch, then it's dominating you, it's putting itself at the same level as you. Um, and that's nonsense. If the dog's going on the couch, it's probably because it likes going on the couch. That doesn't mean you should let your dog on the couch. If you don't want your dog on the couch, don't let it on the couch. But um, this notion of dominance in dog behavior is, is fundamentally uh, well accepted to be wrong. Um, and what I find interesting about that is in my day job as an educator, I, I'm very interested in pedagogic theory and how we learn mathematics in general. And um, a lot of old concepts of how we learn uh, relate to the theory of behavioralism. And behavioralism is essentially the same theory that Pavlov and Pavlov's dogs uh, are all about, that notion that if you ring a bell, dogs will salivate. And that's kind of been the backbone of a lot of educational practice where the idea was, if I make my students do these homeworks, do these tests, read these books, they will be mathematicians. Um, whereas my personal uh, theory of learning that I like to adhere to is something called social constructivism, which is the idea that not only do we learn in a social construct from the people around us, but also that we each have to individually make up our own, our own learning. So I find it interesting that a lot of dog behavior uh, has evolved into this notion of um, away from uh, dominance that comes from our understanding or misunderstanding of wolves. And in human pedagogy, a lot of the time, our theory is actually based on how dogs react when they think they're about to get food. Um, it's well accepted that dogs have five needs. Having a pack leader is not one of them. Uh, the first one is health, they, they, you know, so being able to go see a vet and, and be kept in good health. Companionship, so interaction with other dogs, interaction with human beings. Um, a lot of dogs have been bred for those reasons. Diet, food. Uh, an environment, so warmth, shelter, those things. And the final one is, is behavior, so a little bit of play or, or something, a walk, something like that. Um, and depending on your breed and depending on the dog within your breed, your dogs will need these five things at different levels. So, uh, for example, a whippet uh, is, is far more likely to just want to curl up next to a fire and, and enjoy, enjoy the time uh, there. Um, whereas a border collie, so what I have, uh, Riggins, he's, he's pretty heavy on the five. He could probably sleep outside in the rain on the side of a Welsh mountain for a couple of days, eat every three days, but he needs to work. And, and what he's being bred for is them. Um, 
My wife told me off because apparently that's not a photo of Welsh sheep, but it was uh, the only CC BY photo. It was the first CC BY photo of sheep that came up. Um, and uh, he's designed to work with, with these animals and, and herd them and, 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 um, and interact with uh, a shepherd. Um, we don't have sheep, um, so what, what we have are, are frisbees. Um, and this is, this is kind of a groundbreaking moment uh, that was captured in this photo. It's the point at which Riggins realized that JJ could get the frisbees out of the bag and, and all of a sudden Riggs got a lot more interested in JJ. Um, and so Riggs and I play a sport called Disc Dog. This is one of the books on that sport. It's one of many dog sports. Uh, the most kind of well-known one is the sport of agility, which also you see a lot of Border Collies uh, doing. And um, Disc Dog is a much smaller dog sport. So within the small realm of dog sports, Disc Dog is a smaller one. And um, it has lots of different formats. So, so one of them is a game called Toss and Fetch. And this is a game that's quite nice because it is, you, you basically just need to be able to throw the frisbee and the dog will run, catch in one of these zones and, um, and bring the frisbee back. And you have a minute to essentially do as many catches um, as you can. And if the dog catches it in the air, there's more points. And so that looks something like this. So throw the frisbee, he tracks it. He catches it, he brings it back. You might be able to notice I have an audience in that video. Um, and this is one of the things I'm going to mention about this, this sport, is that generally that's my only audience. So, so that's, that's JJ with a little bit of it might be every now and then. Um, and Riggins loves this. Border Collies particularly love repetitive tasks, so he could do that for a long time. Um, but I don't, I get bored of that. I get bored of that. I, I'll, I'll sometimes do uh, long distance and just have my own little records of how far I can and throw and whatnot, but I, I, I get bored of it. So another sport in this dog is the sport of, of freestyle. And this is a lot more fun for me and it's just as much fun for, for Riggins. And, and the idea is here that you, um, have your dog know a number of behaviors. So for example, a, a simple spin and catch. So he'll spin and I throw him the frisbee. And that, that's, that's one of them. Um, something that's called a scoot, where he does whatever that is. Um, uh, <laughs> um, uh, he can do a, a flip that's relatively self-explanatory. He goes up and gets it like that. Um, goes up on my back, and then he'll, he'll dismount with a catch. Um, what else have we got? Um, so this is just what a, a plain old black back vault looks like. And then this one where he gets up a bit higher, where he goes up off my back. And those are, those are called behaviors. Most people would call them tricks. And um, one of the issues about that is that it's quite interesting when he's learning a new trick. Um, it's, you know, I can use various techniques for him to learn a new trick, make sure he's doing it safely. Um, but after a while, that also gets boring, more for him than for me, because I still think it's cool when he, when he gets up high like that. Um, and that's where sequences of these, of these behaviors come in. So what gets interesting is if you start to put these things together. So uh, for example, this is a particular sequence of various flip behaviors. So I get him to park, get him to jump out, flip over, and then bounce over my chest, uh, off my chest. Um, and then, um, for example, there's, there's this. He does a weave, a catch, I kiss him, helicopter drop down, and then a back vault. Um, now, this is where the Python comes in. Um, <laughs> there is some Python. Not, not much, but there is some. Um, because finding these sequences and, and figuring out what works well uh, together is, is hard. It's very easy for me to go, yep, I have these five or six sequences that I'm going to do, and, and that'll be that. Um, which leads me to this little tool I, I built. Um, 
And it's a very simple Django REST framework. And so out of the box, I, I get this, this admin where I can put in a bunch of um, uh, behaviors. So for example, sit is in there, I think. There's a sit, a sit pretty. But then there's also a Japanese dog catch to helicopter drop down, for example, as a behavior. And once I've got those all in the, the admin, I can just do a, a simple request to my, my REST framework of saying, I want a sequence with five behaviors in it. And so that'll slow down to doing a, a front rebound, a shin stall. I go on my back and he sits on my shins. He'll sit pretty. I'll kick the frisbee to him, and then he'll rebound off, off my leg. Um, and I, I will run this a couple of times before I go out for one of our training sessions and just make a note and go, that, that's, a good, that's a good sequence, that's not a good sequence. And over time, I learn things that can work. Because there's some that are quite natural. I, I don't know if you remember the, the sequence of flips where he's just jumping vertically. They, they, they kind of make a lot of sense. But then every now and then, I'll get the, 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 the tool here will just say, hey, why don't you try and also throw a back stall in the middle of it? And I'll, I'll give it a go. And if it flows nicely, then that, that's good. Um, because fundamentally, it's hard for human beings to be random. This, this lets me, me do that. Um, the code for it is essentially the first three Django REST tutorial pages. That's the behavior where I just say, I want you to keep track of when the thing was created, what it's called, uh, when it was acquired, and when the description was. Because, like, for example, Riggins doesn't know how to do, Riggins and I don't know how to do a footstool just yet. Um, so that, that's, that's a trick that he hasn't acquired yet. Um, the URLs are lovely in, in the, the newest versions of, of Django, I can just say, yep, if I have a behavior and a sequence of a given length with a given seed, I can get that seed, seeded uh, uh, thing come back. And then finally, this is how I actually get the sequence out. So this is it goes through all of the behaviors, randomly picks some, and then, and then uh, throws them back out. And so when you, when you put it all together, I'll just throw up one of his routines, so then a sequence of sequences is, is a routine where he'll do four or five behaviors and then four or five behaviors um, again. So now he's about to do a big over. And then he's about to do some thigh work. And then again, and then I'll Stop it. Um, and there's more. <laughs> so why a Django REST framework? Essentially, for the simplicity of what I'm doing, I could just write all these down as a list, and just every time I have a new one, just add to my list and, and get it to spit out a random one. Um, or why not just use Django itself? Why am I using the Django REST framework? Well, Django itself, to my understanding, I'm not a web developer. Uh, to my understanding, does these three things. It gets stuff out of a database, gets you some data, and it spits you out some HTML. But I don't really know yet where I want this tool to go. Um, I, I, I don't know what type of front end I want to put on it, if any. Um, I don't know uh, a lot of things yet. And so being able to just have just those two things, a database that keeps my data nice and tidy, and getting that data out, which is what the Django REST framework does, does that. Another reason for the Django REST framework is that it wasn't a lot of code. And so it's arguably one of the simplest ways of getting a, a nice GUI is to just use the DRF. Um, one of the things I could do further along the lines is kind of complete the feedback loop, is I could get those sequences uh, back in my database, and I could uh, change the thing from randomly selecting to selecting with a reinforcement learning algorithm. So, some people have said to me, oh, no, just use a neural network, because of course. Um, the problem with getting a neural network is that we need a much bigger house because we need a lot more dogs. Um, but if I were to use just some sort of simple Q learning, reinforcement learning algorithm, it could just learn as it goes. And every now and then say, do you want to try this? And I'll be like, no. And it'll learn what the type of stuff that works well. Um, as I'm finishing up a couple of things, um, there's a uh, lovely young girl who lives near to where we live, and um, she's just gotten a border collie, and she sees me and Riggins do this in the park, and so she's very eager to do the same. Um, uh, please don't just do
do it straight away. So first of all, don't just use any Frisbee. Um, there's, uh, you need to make sure your Frisbees won't shatter when the dog bites them, because if they shatter, they could really hurt the dog. So I actually buy Frisbees that my wife would rather I not buy uh, from the United States that are special dog Frisbees. Uh, interestingly, there's just been a, a, a UK supplier of them called Frisbee School, and I might be sponsored by them. I'm not really sure yet. Uh, we've been exchanging emails, but they're, they're selling the right types of Frisbees. And then the other thing is that you can see on the right there, um, I, I, I treat Riggins like an athlete. Um, he has rest days, he has active days, he has days for prehab and days for rehab um, to make sure that he's, he's jumping quite high, unnaturally high, so I want to make sure he's safe. Um, and kind of coming full circle to this idea of being a pack leader, which as I've said to you is, is nonsense, by doing this with Riggins, by having this relationship where we work together, Whenever we go places, he looks at me like that. Um, and frankly, I look, like him, I look at him in the same way uh, because we're partners, we're friends. Um, I'm on Twitter at DR Vince Knight. Um, I actually don't post anything about, well, very rarely anything about playing Frisbee with my dog on there. I mainly post about mathematics and Python. If you do want to see me playing with my dog, I'm on Instagram at vincent.pradach. The code for Pup Coach, which is very, very minimalistic, is on GitHub. And there's a fantastic tutorial on building up freestyle routines for your disc dog uh, at a website called Positive Vibe. And I'll leave that up, and I'm, that's all I have to say if you have any questions. Thank you, Vince. Are there questions? That's okay. <laughs> So how long does it take you to teach your dog one of these tricks? Yeah, so that's a very good question. Um, so it depends. Um, R Riggins is, is, is a, a very neurotic uh, a working line collie. So, so he's just desperate for me to teach him anything. So um, it, it, any dog can do this. Any dog can learn these things. Um, but some dogs will probably have less drive than others, whereas Riggins is just very, very driven. Um, but nonetheless, it, it depends. So um, for example, it probably took me a whole week to teach him to jump up on my back because that was a very unnatural thing for him to do. He was like, no, no, I need to be away from you so that I know where the disc is going. Um, but it took him about a week to, to, to be like, oh, you want me to go up there? And then now that he's up there, uh, jumping off in different ways and whatnot, that, that'll take uh, a day or two. Um, I mentioned something called the foot stall, where I'm on my back and he's sitting on my feet. That's a trick that's eluded us for a couple of years. So, so it, it really does depend. Um, thank you, Vincent. You said several times, you used the word designed when you were talking about yes. dogs. And I thought, well, of course, Vincent's just being rather loose with the word design. And then I saw some of the videos of the dog going backwards and forwards through your legs. I thought, actually, you know, this does look like something that was designed to do that, and I wanted to know, ask if your experience of interacting with your dog in this way over such a long period of time has made you think differently about whether animals like dogs exist in themselves or whether they truly have been, in some sense, designed by us over time. Yeah, so I think that's a very good question. Um, uh, to, to, I, 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 I am not personally of the belief of intelligent design as a... Uh, a creation uh, theory, but I definitely believe that dogs as a breed and as, as a species in particular have been, um, you know, through genetic selection over hundreds of years designed, and I would use that word. Um, some things that Riggins does without prompt whatsoever uh, are, are so clearly imprinted in him where he'll, he'll see anything that looks like a sheep and he'll just go down straight away and just stare at it, you know? And, and, uh, and, and that's very much, you know, it's, it's quite awesome, in the right use of the word, to see, actually, to see how that somehow is there. And then, similarly, a dog like Toby, the little Border Terrier, uh, the way any small hole or anything, she'll, she'll be happy to go down there. So, so I, I, I do think dogs are, are an example where us humans have very much uh, remove them quite far from the wolf species. 
All right, we have time for one more question. Thank you. So pets are very good at training us to do things. What yes. has Riggins <laughs> trained you to do? Um, that's an excellent point. Uh, <laughs> uh, so that's an excellent point. Um, one of the things he's taught me to do is spend a lot of money on Frisbees. <laughs> um, well, it, it's interesting because uh, I, I think we, we had a, border a dog that was a, a half border collie before. I've grown up all my life with labs. And, and I think if, if only because of his temperament and because of how much he needed to work, he's taught me a lot more about dogs as a species um, and learning how to throw in whatever weather comes our way. <laughs> All right, thank you, Vince.